Nice. Looking good. Seeing thumbs. Cool. Are we live? We're live. Live? Awesome. All right, All right guys. Well, welcome into Loophole Live. Uh, my name's Nick. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, we got a really great show today. Uh, we're going to talk about some really cool stuff. We are graced by the presence of uh, <laughs> VP of product here, Tim Lesser. So that's how it's going to be. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, we're off to a great <laughs> yeah. start. We're just setting the presidents <laughs> out right here, right now. So, uh, Tim, I, I, I want you to talk a little bit about your journey here at Loophold because I think it's sure. a cool one. Um, kind of coming in from entry level, working out the way, you know, I'll let you tell it because you okay. tell it best, but I think it's a really cool story. Fair enough. So um, I was a hunting guide in Wyoming and a lot of the, the folks from the Loophole brand would come out and hunt with us every year. Uh -huh. And so I got to see some of uh, the camaraderie and some of the things that were going on there. And, and so over time, as I got done with college and some of the other things, I ended up coming out here. And, right. Uh, and I, w I started by answering phones, sending out um, catalogs, um, out, know, out in the tech service room, right? So yeah, when you call so one I, under, one I answer the phone. You were talking to Tim, maybe. Yeah. Hand write a hand write a, a letter. You're an envelope. You know, drop a catalog in, mail it out. Yeah. Uh, eventually, you know, there's more to building a scope than than you would <laughs> at first think. Slightly complex. Um, yeah. So as, as I uh, started to learn more about how that worked, what we did is it was that tech service department. To yeah. Your, to your point, so we'd work on if people were having um, issues in the field. How do I make this work to the best of the ability uh, of the product or um, how do I set this up to ballistics to, I mean, you've done the job, right? Yep, so right. it's everything. Yeah, you get you um, get all kinds of questions, crazy questions, uh, uh, funny <laughs> questions. Uh, I still talk to guys that I talk yeah. to in tech service, yeah. right? You form some cool relationships with some customers. Cause, so Because you're working directly yeah. with them, right? You're back yeah. and forth, and so they reply directly to your your email inbox. And, and so I did that for, for a number of years because it takes a while to, to figure all those questions <laughs> yeah, out right. from how do you pronounce loophole to <laughs> the most detailed, uh, you know, ballistics type questions you could get. Yeah. Um, went through a number of years there on the phone, which I, I think it honestly is the best place uh, to start in a lot of cases because you learn every product inside and out and we hear that's what people like and yeah, what they don't well, like. When I'm doing tours, yeah. I, I show them that room and I'm like, this is mm -hmm. probably one of the hardest jobs within the company, uh, but it's also one of the most fulfilling jobs too. And it sure. sets you up with this knowledge base then to go off to other departments like you're probably going to talk about. Yeah. Here, so. so, you know, it's, <laughs> you get nothing but that consumer feedback, right? Yeah. Whether it's this part's great, this part's hard to use, uh, whatever it is, we get that nonstop, you know, thousands a day in some cases. Um, so from there, uh, I was able to take some of that knowledge that I'd learned about all the products and, and transition over to marketing. How do we talk about this differently? Right. How do we solve some of those questions up front so that you already have the answer before uh, you need to make a phone call? Mm -hmm. um, from there, it, uh, it kind of kept going until we were working on new products, which was always kind of where my heart was. Right, I've right. Been out in the field. I'm still doing some guiding at the time. Um, did that for about 10 years, even while I was here. Uh, and go back to Wyoming, take stuff with me, and figure out again what if I tweak this? What yeah. if I change Test that? Test it in the field and get you know exactly. real world feedback. You know, yeah, from using yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, so that got me into the, the product group at the time. So mm -hmm. there's product line managers, and, and we go through and, and kind of segment the business up by business units, so rifle scopes versus you know observation. Right, right. We're here to talk about today with binoculars and spotting scopes, right? Um, use that stuff out in the field. I had a, a great opportunity then with, um, with a family company. I left and joined them for a little bit, for right. just under a year. Uh, went out and, and helped with some of their product development, uh, led the sales and marketing teams there. And then I was able to, to come back here and, right. and lead the product group, which is dream yeah. come true. Yeah, I, I, again, I just think that's a cool story because now you got someone in charge of product who not only was a professional guide, right? Did this for a living to put food on his table, <laughs> use these products, uh, uh, but someone who's still passionate about it, shoots, hunts, it. and really yeah. lives the life, right? And I think that has shown its way into the products that are coming out. And, yeah. and listening to the consumer a lot, making exactly what they want. You know how you want it, how you, how you want to use it in the field, right? It, and yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, I think it, it shows in the new stuff it, coming out. It helps, right? So yeah. I, I had the view from the, the hunting guide perspective. I had it as a hunter because we're out doing this you know, all the time. Yeah. Um, had it on the phone, 
had yeah. it with different clients. That's so we try to mesh, you know, mesh all that with with what our our trade partners are looking for as well. Yep, yep. also um, important. And, Absolutely. And you know, now one of the things that we do because I'm I'm in this office a lot, you lose that edge just just a little <laughs> bit. I'm not out there 200 days every, a year. Everyone's like yeah, everyone's yeah. like, oh, you work in the industry, you must get the hunt and shoot so much, <laughs> and you're just like, oh, I, get, I get to talk about it a lot, but I right. don't, I, you don't get to do it as much as you would love like to, right? So and so you know that's where we use our, our pro guide council. Um, yeah. And so yeah, we've got a, a, a group of folks that will come in and, and they use this stuff all day, every day, right? Um, it's their livelihood. And so we bring them in and, and use them to help make sure that, that we need to level set our thinking. Yep, yep, so. uh, that's, a, that's a great resource. Yep. Um, so uh, thanks for the background there. I sure. think that, that gives some uh, people some context about you and what you do here. <laughs> that's great. Um, so what we're gonna talk about today, we're gonna talk about first, we're gonna talk about our Twilight Light Management System, the different okay. levels of it and what that actually means to the end user in the field, what they're gonna what what they're gonna see, um, yeah. it sounds kind of markety sometimes when you say it. you're like Twilight Max Light Management System, um, but uh, we're gonna put some real world benefits and, and, and right. things behind it that you know again that you're gonna experience in the field. Uh, then we're also gonna segue. We're gonna talk about our uh, new BX5 Sandy M binoculars too because we're really. Yeah. We're really proud of these things. We're really happy about them. And yeah, uh, these are great. It, it's yeah. going in a direction in the bino market that we haven't gone before. And uh, anyway, we're super excited about them. We're gonna talk mm -hmm. about them more. So, uh, but let's get back to the lenses. And I wanted to get this out of the way because I think we're probably gonna get some questions Always about do. it. Yeah. This is the question, where do your lenses come from? Okay. So, so t take it away. You, you, yeah, you know so, better than anyone else. So the, the answer to that is, um, Quite frankly, it doesn't. It doesn't really matter. Um, <laughs> yeah. And let me explain to that. I don't want it to be off-putting at all. What, what's going on is it's a number one question that we get. Well, you know, where does your glass come from? So if you go back and you look at glass as a global at a, at a global level, there's only a handful of sources, right? I mean, you're talking right. four or five total for for just glass blanks, um, and it's what you do with that afterwards that really matters. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we've used race car analogies, which rubber yeah. tree did the tire come from? Yeah. It doesn't really matter until you've transformed it into a tire, right? Yep. So on the glass, um, we get our, our glass from proprietary sources because we know exactly what we're looking for. We've got multiple optics labs right in the facility here. Uh, and we design to specific requirements. Yeah, you know, I, so. I think that's one of the biggest differentiators is we have an optics lab where we have world-class engineers who are designing Absolutely. all yeah. these optical prescriptions from the ground up. So we're not just going to a supplier and saying, hey, we want this, we want this magnification, we'll just take off the shelf solutions, whatever you have, you're making. We are telling them exactly yeah. what they need to be making. Again, I think plays into the difference that you see in the performance of the, the, the lens makes systems. It, makes right? a huge difference, yeah. right? So where, where do you get it from? That's a lot different than saying this is exactly what we need yeah. and going out to this group of global um, suppliers and saying this is what it needs to do, this is exactly how it's specified, <coughs> we need to get this coming in. So it's it's dynamic where, where the lenses are coming from, uh, proprietary yeah. sources um, just for us, but it's, it's done in a manner to match the design that we've already created mm -hmm. rather than the opposite where you would go out and say, well, here's the glass available, what can I do with that? Yeah, exactly, right. exactly. And then the flip side of that, when those lenses come in, you know, it's trust but verify, right? We're going to yep. take those lenses and we're actually going to look at them and test them for those specs before they go into a scope, before they go into whatever we're making, um, to make sure that that, uh, that lens was built correctly and is going to perform for the lifetime uh, of the product, right? Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, that's right where we're headed with the, with the Twilight management systems here, yeah. is you can't set something up to, <clears throat> to succeed in every situation that's out there, but yeah. you can get really, really close. Yeah, exactly. And you have to do that from the ground up. If you're doing it the other way, it, it doesn't work. You're going to give a lot, and, and as we'll talk about, yeah. either at dawn and dusk or in the middle of the day. Now, yeah. if I had to pick, yeah. I'd lose it in the middle of the day. Right. But ironically, that's not necessarily <laughs> what um, what some people do. They yeah. optimize for, for well, we, you know, we can talk about it. Yeah. Optimize for light like you'd see here, you know, where it's at retail, and that's not where hunters need it. Right. Yeah. Um, and Or shooters, right? There's glare in real life. There's dust. There's sun setting behind you or rising in front of you, there's a number of problems. Yeah, right? yeah. So. it's funny, we got, we got some comments here. It says, just admit your glasses from China. Uh, it, it doesn't come from China. <laughs> uh, there's different sources. Um, we, we've been very transparent, I think, about where the glass comes from. And again, talking about yeah. where the glass comes from, that's not, really, that's not really the point of all this, right? Well, um, and, and let's, I mean, let's be completely honest about yeah. it. There, there is not 
a U.S. Yeah. Oh, that, supply. You know, that's the other part of um, it. Yeah. That's large enough to even remotely come close to what we need. Absolutely. Uh, and so we're we're out there getting it the the highest level of glass that we can to match those needs from wherever we can get it from right now. Uh, and it was a lot easier to just get this set up where we have a proprietary source that matches off with our demands and creates it exactly the way that we do. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, yeah. It, it is what it is. We live in a global uh, society now, right? So, yep. um, but that good point. Um, and also just a reminder, yeah, we are taking questions. Type your yeah. questions. We got guys, I got the questions coming up live on my computer yep. right here. So as we kind of go through this stuff, we'll try to answer as many as we can. And uh, you know, thanks for participating. So let's Absolutely. get back to that Twilight uh, Light Management System. Sure. And what it actually does for the shooter. And you mentioned it kind of uh, briefly there. Um, those Twilight uh, or the uh, the dusk and dawn, really when light is um, critical, with low light situations. But that's where there's a lot of action, right? That's when yeah. animals are starting to move yep. around a lot, right? Yeah, so for hunters, right, and, and we want to be sure to address whether it's long-range shooting yeah, and other shooting things as well. Too, right? yeah. So for this, let's start with hunting. Um, we, a lot of hunters here, uh, a lot of, a lot of um, matching our optics for things like that. So mm -hmm. let's just start there. So yeah. dawn and dusk, we all know that's when, when you see more animals. It's, it's, you're not as likely to see these, these big bulls, these big bucks at noon unless it's peak of the rut, and then you probably have a bow in your hand, not a rifle. Um, so what we're trying to do is look at the whole visible spectrum of light. So at dawn and at dusk, you have different colors that are that are showing up in the in the light that you're looking at. It right. doesn't seem like it, but if you think back at twilight, things look kind of bluish or kind of reddish at sunrise and sunset. Yeah. There's yeah. a reason for that. The though. magic hour, right? You want to take photos and get those cool like yeah, the light coming why through, people right? Glow and, yeah, yeah, and, right. and everything, right? Exactly. So you, you've got a different balance of light that's out there. And what we've done with, say, light transmission, that's the first question that we get, what's your light transmission? Yeah. So let's, let's start there. Um, we, we do everything we can to, to use the glass itself and the coatings to elevate the ends, so the dawn and the dusk yeah. part of the, of the visible spectrum. In some cases, that means you have to sacrifice a little bit right in the middle in the greens. Yep. Um, but you can take pretty much any optic and, and you have enough daylight that's at what noon, I, uh, which is where we would lose yeah, that. That's, I'll tell people, um, it's, it's, it's uh, I don't want to call it simple because any optical design is mm -hmm. complex in and of itself. But to design an optical system that performs well in uh, at high noon when there's a lot of light outside right. isn't that difficult. It's those early morning, late evening, mm -hmm. low light situations where things really count. Uh, that's that that's harder to do, and uh, our optical engineers, our wizards in the, in the lab over there, <laughs> have done some stuff that I again, even um, even the VX Freedom, right? Your your mm -hmm. well entry level scope. I hate calling it entry level though because take that scope and look at it <laughs> yeah. versus a thousand dollar competitor scope and you're gonna be like, whoa, I'm, how do they do yeah. this, right? Yeah, it's, it's blown away. Well, that, and that's the main reason we've taken this Twilight Max uh, or this Twilight Lens system and, and pushed it across all of our lines. We'll talk about how we, we finally got the Twilight Max HD version mm -hmm. out in, in binos when we get there. But let me, I, I wanna back up because I feel like we're, we're gonna gloss over that it's really a three-pronged approach that we take. So yep. we've got, you know, 85, ish engineers um, here working all the time. Some are optical engineers, electronics, etc. Yeah. But this team, when you look at it, um, including the techs, we have nearly a hundred folks that are in the engineering department with, you know, nearly a thousand years of experience all in <laughs> geometric optics, right? Yeah. So we, we know a thing or two about getting that done and now what we've done is backed in and said, how do we make this the best for all for all lights? Right. And, and really to boil it down to the top three things are the light transmission, which yeah. we were talking about with coatings and yeah. glass. Yeah. Um, the resolution, so how clearly can you can you see it? I think we've all noticed that if you've used an, an less than than good quality spotting scope when you turn it up. It got bigger, uh, but you can't it, see it's more. super fuzzy and you can't see detail, right? right? Yeah, so that's absolutely. that's kind of resolution. And then when you're looking at contrast is something that we, we don't hear a lot about. If you balance all three of those, like hitting the uh, autocorrect button on your photo, <laughs> right here, just balance that out. Oh, look, I, I, I right. look amazing now. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, that's essentially what we're trying to do is balance those three things so it's like an autocorrect button. Mm -hmm. um, the light transmission is accomplished through coatings and maximizing what light you let through, yep. but it's also done through optical design. If you start putting a ton of lenses in there, uh, not only does the optic get heavy, more likely to break yep. uh, under recoil, 
but you're losing more light because now, you're more surface. Yeah, you have more gates yeah. now that that light has to pass through, right? And um, the light transmission thing, that's an interesting conversation because um, I've, I've seen companies not do it so much nowadays. I think they've been called <laughs> out on it, but they'll, they used to be like, we got 99% light transmission, but that was on one lens within on one the system. Surface of one so lens, what, yeah. what's 99% yeah. of 97% of, but, but, but all the way through the system, right. what's your total light transmission through all those lens elements? That's the real number that you would want to know. Mm -hmm. And light transmission, like you said, is only part of the puzzle. So, uh, so it can be a little misleading. Yeah, right? absolutely. So yeah. light transmission is a measure of how much light hit the front of the optic, This, in this case a binocular, compared to how much comes out. So we can test that very easily uh, in the lab. Mm -hmm. Lab is sensitive enough, the temperature of the room will affect it. So we need to lock everything up, make sure it's very stable, that's yeah. why it's all on, on air ride suspension yeah. out there. Right. But glare is also technically light transmission. So what is glare? Glare is the, the light that's coming in off axis and bouncing around. Right. Um, you know, if you've ever tried to project while well, you're sitting in, in your house watching TV, if all the lights are on, yeah. the TV doesn't look quite as crisp as when it's dark and yeah. you turn the lights out. Yeah. That's because you've got less stray light coming down from the ceiling or in right. through the windows, yeah. interfering with the light from the TV coming straight to your eye. Yeah. Technically, that light, even though it's bouncing around and filtering out the image, is light transmission. Right. So what it's, some people do is they count glare in their number. <laughs> yeah, and, which boosts uh, that number up. Gives you more transmission, yeah. but it makes the optic much more difficult not, to use. Not all light um, is created equal, right? No. Yeah, exactly. We, we want the yeah. good light. I, I, I tell the uh, story, if you, now you can do the thing with your phone, you have the little projector and you go in the backyard and the kids want to watch the movie in the backyard. Yep. You got to wait till dark or else you can't see the image, right? Mm -hmm. um, same idea, there's too much ambient light from the sun and that image is washed out. Um, same concept it's within a, the, the it's optics exactly there. What, it's exactly what glare does. Yep. It's exactly what glare So does. we do some cool mechanical things. Uh, one thing that uh, people will notice when they, yeah. they look down the scopes, there is those ridges inside the scope. Yeah, you know. I mean, think of it like a muffler in a yeah, car, right? So exactly. If, if the light's coming in at this angle and it's ultimately going to try to bounce around and yeah. be the glare, mm -hmm. um, we'd rather cut that out. Yeah. Have it gone so that the pure light coming straight through that's right. going to reach your eye from the target yep. uh, is... is the more predominant light. Yeah, so you got these little ridges controlling gl glare inside the scope, and it's interesting because those ridges are, are different heights and different angles depending on the the, oh, the, sure. the bell, yeah. you know, how, and how long the bell is. And it, uh, people way smarter than me come up with this stuff. I, <laughs> I, can't, I can't believe the stuff they come up with. Um, let's see, some cool, uh, uh, this is a very important question. I want to get this out of the way. How much can Tim bench press? That's I, I, you're a little big, bigger than me. I feel so. like this is coming from. So, I, <laughs> you someone, think this is an internal someone's question? Someone's messing with me I on that so. deal. Yeah, yeah. I, I know where that's coming from. So he doesn't want to say because it's <laughs> a really low number. It, well, I'm, I got the bar and the collars, <laughs> um, and I can do that ten times. Nice, I'm up nice. To that. Yep. Um, uh, Josh Allen, sixty-eight on IG. He wanted to know how the freedom scopes uh, are. Um, uh, we talked a little bit mm -hmm. about the, the the twilight light management system that's in it. But the, yep. the, the freedoms have been, um, I've, I've been really impressed with, um, well, the response that we've gotten from people using them and yeah. um, all, all the years of experience that's gone into rolling so, that line out. Yeah, right? so the VX freedoms have been received very, very well. Um, one of the things that we're seeing here is, is, like we said, we've been building rifle scopes here in, in Oregon for yeah. lots, of, lots and lots of years, and, and everything is rolled into that VX frame. We're really proud of it yeah. because it's, it's essentially everything we learned building VX 2s then VX 2s yeah. VX 1s all of that stuff compiled with the, the, the most you know, current test data that actually allows you to, to learn even more yeah. is all wrapped into that VX Freedom, but it's done at the, at the, the value price point. You're, it's going to be very difficult to get more value than, than the VX Freedom line. Yeah, uh, just as uh, for your dollar. Scotty, our producer over here, uh, good uh, little uh, tidbit of information. So check out the August issue of Guns and Ammo. Um, I don't. It's obviously not out now. It'll be coming out. <laughs> um, we we may get advanced copies of stuff. Uh, but there is a uh, article about the Freedom in there, the VX Freedom. Uh, mm -hmm. Check it out. I, I read through the article. Um, he the guy hit the nail on the head. I I forgot who, who wrote it, but um, it was a really well written article, and I think does justice to the the VX Freedom. So For good sure. good question there. Okay. Um, Let's see, I have a VX3, uh, oh, this is Steven on IG. I have a VX3 30 uh, millimeter tube with finger adjustment cap knobs. Can I have M1 style uh, turret installed by the custom shop? Uh, yes, you can. 
Um, just uh, call up uh, 100 Loophold, press the option for custom shop, and uh, one of those guys over there can get you set up. With, one of the, uh, one of the beautiful need. things about yeah. building it right here in the facility is uh, when, when we want to change it or um, dress it up or, or just inspect it as, as part of the lifetime warranty, it's right here. It's easy to do. The same people that built it are doing it in the same place that they built it. Yeah, so. yeah, great point. Uh, another uh, custom shop question while we're on the tangent here real quick. Uh, let me <laughs> scroll down. Um, can the custom shop add more magnification to the VX5 HD? So no, uh, we can't. There, yep. there were some companies back in the day that would put boosters and stuff on scopes. We don't recommend doing any of that kind of stuff. Obviously, it avoids the warranty if you take it apart and add parts to it yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah. But with that, there may be some stuff coming down the pipe. Uh, we can't really talk about it yet, but there may be some higher <laughs> magnification stuff coming and uh, that yeah. you, would be, you would be more than pleased with in the VX5 line there. So keep your eyes out for that. Uh, let's get back to the, the, the twilight management here real quick. Okay. Um, one thing, uh, you kind of mentioned it briefly, um, the fluorescent light versus uh, natural light. Right. And when, we're, okay. when I'm taking people around on a tour here, I make a, I make a <laughs> note of, of saying, we actually, we have a courtyard out back. It's got this big board. It actually kind of looks like it does, this. It does look like um, this. It has a lot of these same elements on there, the contrast and the color resolution. And people are like, well, why do you have that board? And that's because we want to check the scopes out in a real world lighting condition. Yeah. Um, the unfortunate part is most purchases are made in a fluorescent light situation, right? It's, it's difficult. You come in, you know, and uh, you've got fluorescent light. You look through it, they all look great. Yeah. You make a decision based on how black the reticle looks. Yeah, it exactly. Because it gives you apparent contrast uh, in some cases. And then, you know, the, we've got, Michael B likes to say, you don't know you've been duped until you're out on the line. <laughs> I right? love that line. I, you know, I, I you use that line all the time. I and, should give him credit. And unless you've got them side by side out in a real world environment, you'll never know. You'll never know until someone else comes along and says, here, try this, and you're done, you're done ringing steel, or you can't see that deer, yeah. uh, and they can, right? And so you kind of, that, that, that's a real eye opener. I encourage everyone, if possible, to test these things in real light, outside yeah. of a building, yeah. in, as the sun sets. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah. Let it get, start getting dark. Let, yeah. it, let those light rays change. You'll see the difference um, that, that really designing this from the ground up to be used outside rather than sold inside yeah. uh, will do. Test how much that counter staff guy really wants to sell you that scope. Ask him <laughs> if, he, if you guys can go out in the parking lot and look at them side by side, you know, right before they close at dusk like that. So, but I think that's a very important part. It's something that, um, you don't think about maybe it's not intuitive to think about when you're making a purchasing decision on that. Um, the other thing too about this, we talk about light management stuff. It's also we talked about resolution. So when you're looking through a scope too, it's not just about looking through the center of that scope, which we tend to right. do. Just you kind of look through, but actually look at the outer part of the the, the lens too, right? It, um, that that's something I think the optical engineers do here have done an awesome job at. It, it can be difficult, right? Because you need a curved lens to create mm -hmm. magnification, right? You, who's ever seen a flat magnifying glass doesn't work. Yeah, no. Nope. Um, so you need that curved surface. What you don't want is your resulting image to appear curved at all. And we get so focused on the, the reticle that you may look dead center if it's a basic reticle, duplex style. Yeah. Uh, if it's a grid style, you may start looking closer towards the bottom and that yeah. can be a, a dead giveaway. You look down there in the yeah. boxes or the grid looks like it gets bigger or smaller. Um, but really what that, what that does for you is if it's not flat yeah. all the way across the field, when you're looking through that scope, things don't look natural mm -hmm. and as you pan back and forth you may get eye strain but more importantly you say I'm not on a rifle scope I'm not panning around it's not like a bino mm -hmm. um, but it it does not look as as real and as crisp right and so you're you're more likely to miss things in, in yeah. the field not not miss the shot per se but miss little fine pieces yeah. of things that are, you might, that are happening. You, you might be looking somewhere here and there might be some antlers down in a bush down there right. that you may not see if that image isn't going to be crisp and then, but if it is, you're gonna see it and you, then you can come over to it and be like, oh, okay, I see what that is. Now, really, right? really helps you find, you right. know, you're using that whole field of view. Uh, it helps you find the, the critter or the target, get on target quickly. And, and you know, you're talking about getting all the way out to the edge. One thing to really compare and look at is when you get up, if you've got two scopes, whatever it is, when you get up in the eye box where you can get a full sight picture, look at how, how much you fill that eyepiece. Mm. So we call it eyepiece fill. Yeah. Uh, there's a number of ways to, to quantify this, but I'm sure you've, you've seen it before where it looks like you're looking through a straw. 
you've got a full field of view, but there's this big black donut around your field of view. Yeah. That is now stuff that you're not catching in your peripherals mm -hmm. and you're not catching in the scope. We fill that eyepiece so that it's a, a very smooth transition. It just looks like a reticle appears. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, I even missed that writing my notes for this thing is talking about iBox and how that actually plays in to the, the lens mm -hmm. system and the design of it. Um, one thing that I noticed and you know, we obviously, we shoot loophole scopes. We work for loophole. We like loophole a lot. We actually, I shoot competitor scopes too. Shoot a lot of them. If I go out to the range or, you know, out with some buddies and they have something else, I'll be like, hey, can I try that? And one thing I notice is, man, you, you pull loophole up and it's just easier to get on target because of that, the optical design and the it, eye box being so big and forgiving, right? It, You're not straining around mm -hmm. on the rifle trying to, you know, find where you need to be. Ironically, that is something you can design into the scope. It's not yeah. a... Um, well, this one seems easier to use than that one. I like it. That's yeah. why I'm going to buy those. It, it can purposely be designed in, and we've done yeah. that. So yeah. um, when you go back, try comparable scopes, and, and you'll notice the usability um, yeah. is much, I, much higher. We're, so. we're tooting our own horns a lot here, but I, I, <laughs> I'm I, proud I, of what I, we, do. I, we, we love what we do. But I encourage you to go out, try other brands, try other things, because I think once you do, you're, you're going to see the, the expertise in that design that we're talking about here. Uh, uh, it comes to life, right, when you look through the scope and mm -hmm. is real. We're gonna take some more questions here. I was remiss, I didn't mention. Uh, of course, we like to do giveaways, so we're gonna give away a couple hats for the best questions here. And we got, we got a ton of questions rolling in. I was trying to Great. keep up with the scroll here. Um, uh, <laughs> we actually a lot of custom shop questions. Uh, so can you? Uh, uh, it's okay, we're, we're flexible. Yeah, right. Let's go for it. Brad on IG, can you put a silver finish on a scope uh, price? Yes, we can. Um, that's why the custom shop's there. We can also do custom <laughs> um, finishes as well. Um, uh, man, price, I'm not, I don't know off the top of my head. You're gonna have to call one of the guys, call it 100 loophole. Uh, like I said, press can, the custom shop option. Yeah, we can find that, I'm, yeah. I'm not sure. You yeah. know, so on an existing scope, it'd, be, it'd need to be a Cerakote, right? Right, yep. So once the scope is built, uh, one of the things we have to do is we'll have to apply Cerakote to it on the outside rather than anodizing it because anodize goes down into the metal, similar to a tattoo. By the time you were to peel the anodize off, it would mm -hmm. be out of dimension. Yeah. So what we're going to do is uh, it, to to dye a or to to coat a black scope silver. We'll need to add a Cerakote yeah. to that. And yeah. We'll, we can. Totally, that's an easy quote. Totally could do that. Do that. Uh, on that same uh, path there, Rodney Goldie on IG. Why did you guys stop making a uh, gloss finish? So. Uh, we can do gloss finish through the custom shop, but I don't know if you want to talk to a little bit why we kind of stopped doing the, the production gloss. Scopes. Sure, yeah, it, it, to be perfectly honest, it relates to the, the demand. Um, what we were finding is we were producing those scopes and the demand is, is pretty darn low. They're high touch, so we need lots of equipment here that, that actually takes the aluminum after we've gone through. So we machine it and then we, f we, we finish the machine marks off. They're very, very small. But before you're going to anodize, we need to make sure we have a very consistent finish. So we bead blast, and then they go and, and we anodize them. In order to make a gloss finish, we add in a polishing step that's there that takes up a lot of space to do in production, okay? Takes up lots of space, it's very difficult to do. We build the gloss scopes up, they sit, they wait. They weren't moving quickly enough to keep up with some of the product line changes, if yeah. we're going to be honest. Yeah. So now we have scopes in inventory that hadn't, <clears throat> that hadn't moved, and it's time to make the new version of that, and we still haven't sold the other ones. It was it was easier to transition that to our custom shop, and we'll just build it as you want it. So um, now we can do it on a smaller scale, yep. and we don't have to keep it in inventory. We can actually just just build it upon request. Yeah, so it's a way better answer than I would have gave. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, Grant uh, two eight one 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 on Instagram. There, this is a great question. Um, sounds like he's getting his son into hunting there. Uh, awesome. Best scope to get my son. He just got a Tika Youth two four, uh, 243. Uh, probably won't sh shoot past the 100 yards right now, 200 max. Um, what's the best scope? Um, uh, I know what I'm going to say. Let's see if you're going to agree. Does he say if it's a bolt gun? Uh, let's see. It's a 243. It's probably a bolt gun. Be. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a bolt gun. Um, we're probably in, in similar boats here. I, I'm going to go Freedom. We have VX Freedom. We just got done kind of talking about yep. that. I mean... Uh, for your first scope, a VX Freedom three to nine by forty, uh, the you know I, I don't think you can go wrong with that. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think? So that and that's where we would we would vary a little bit. And I'll tell you, I, I oh. may have made the mistake. I go VX Freedom for sure. That yeah. that scope will last you know forever. One of the things that I like to do with uh, I've got three kids that we've brought up through shooting. One's 
you know, left eye dominant and right handed. So now we're working. <laughs> That's a challenge. If he wants to shoot shotgun, he's yeah. got to have it on the other shoulder. So okay. now he's learning to shoot rifles on the other shoulder. Yeah. Uh, I, I actually like getting down to a two to seven. Kids oh, have great that's, eyes. Yeah, that's um, it won't grow you know, as long. I, I prefer to hunt with a three to nine over a two to seven. But one of the things that you get on that low power is you've got two power and a 33 millimeter objective. Um, that, that ratio for that really big forgiving eye box for a young shooter that may have a gun that's too big, right? And can't lean forward far enough to see through it. It helps them, it almost works like a red dot where the eye relief isn't as critical. So with my kids, I found that length of pull was difficult and in order to get there, a two to seven actually helped a little bit. Now yeah. a three to nine will grow with them and, and yeah. work forever, yeah. as will a two to seven. Yeah. Um, but uh, Two to seven works too. I mean, yeah, you could grow maybe into a different scope, take that two to seven. To me, two to seven is a great rimfire scope too. Exactly. You can put that on anything else that you know you want to do. So. Yep. Either of those will yeah. work. That was the only reason I went a yeah. little lower, yeah, a little more fine. forgiving. Yeah, you got options. That's why we make all these <laughs> different models, right? Um, let's see, let's, uh, let's take one more question here before we get into the Sandy Ams. Um, Mike Crotz uh, on Facebook, when are you guys going to have a bino range finder? So I think some people have probably seen some prototypes out there here and there. Uh, so they know we're kind of working on it. About. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Still. <laughs> um, you know, I would love to commit to an answer on that. What I, what I will tell you is we don't, we don't want to release anything until it's right. Yeah. So uh, it's something we've been looking at for a while. We've gone through a few designs. Uh, by the time you get into a range finding bino, there's a lot of moving parts, meaning it's got to work. It has to work in the fog, it has to work in the rain, it has to work after you've dropped it, it has to work after you've bumped it, and the, the beam still needs to be pointing where the Abs crosshairs absolutely are. Absolutely. Right. There's a lot of things there that we want to make sure are, are perfectly um, usable in the harshest conditions after they've been dropped. When uh, warranties don't do you any good, the, prod the, the product has to perform. And yeah. that's what we're trying to do because this is going to mm -hmm. be one of those things that that um, w when we bring it to market, it's going to be used by the elite of the elite down to the everyday hunter, and uh, it's got to be perfect. Yep. So I can't commit to it yet because yep. we need to make sure it goes through all those tests and does everything. Nope, I was putting you on the spot. Care. I that's didn't right. think you were going to commit to it, but I, I, that's a great... That's We've been a, working on, on this type of thing for yeah. years and years. We're always looking at everything. It's a great so. point, and I think... There's I, not much we're not working on. Right. Uh, you know, we'll go to shows or something and be like, oh, why are you guys late to market? You guys, you know, let your competitors do this first. Back to Tim's point, because we are going to do it absolutely right out of the gate and and get it mm -hmm. right, and not put a product out there that has a liability and an issue or something like that, right? So um, that's that's the reason behind that. So um, let's uh, uh, caveat from the questions a little bit. We'll get back to more questions there. Okay. Let's talk about these BX5 uh, Sandy sure. HD binos. So this is kind of new territory for us in the bino realm, right? We're obviously yep. we're obviously known for our rifle scopes. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the the quality, the premium lenses, the systems that we talked about there. Uh, but explain a little bit, you know, talk a little bit about the BX5, the same sure. there. So, you know, we were talking about Twilight Max and, and that there's essentially three levels there. We didn't, we didn't get all the way into that. I don't know that we need to go back, yeah. but we have Twilight, we have Twilight Max, and we have Twilight Max HD. Right. And Twilight yep. Max HD adds in a number of things, um, like a Guardian coating on the outside that's scratch proof takes off fingerprints, right. mud, dirt, water. Yeah, right. yeah, right. You throw them in the water, pick them up. It's kind of like Rain-X, you know, for your, for your car, for your windshield, yep. kind of same Just idea. Keeps, keeps the smudges more robust. off, right? I mean, yep. they, your fingerprints don't stick. And yep. what that helps you do in the field is you're not constantly <laughs> one of these out in the field before you use it. Um, so the, this Sandy M line has our Twilight Max HD lens system. And so what we're really trying to do is transition everything that we've that we've learned and everything that we know about building optics over into premium binoculars as well. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, we've talked about what do the lens coatings do is contrast, resolution, glare, all those things are equally if not more important here because you're going to be looking through your binos for hours, right? At least the, the way that a lot of people in in uh, the western stands and, yeah. and a lot of you're going to sit and look through those binos. So the and usability has to be even even more that, critical, and that's right? one of the keys. When we first got prototypes of these coming out, um, the, the first feedback we heard is how comfortable they are to glass long periods yeah. of time. And being a former professional guide, I think you can attest to the extreme eye strain that you can get <laughs> if you don't have a good <laughs> pair of glasses and you're there, mm -hmm. you know, glassing for eight, nine hours a day and then, trying to find stuff, right? That, and that's exactly it. Yeah. Right? So um, when you're sitting there, it depends. Some hunters, by no 
stays right here. Um, a lot of shooters, it's set off to the side. Yeah. But there are a lot of folks that it's not sitting here. It's only here until you get to the top of the hill. Mm. And then you're glassing, you've got your spotter, you've got your bino, and you're picking apart every hill that's out there, looking for an antler tip, looking for a white throat patch, the flick of an ear. Right. Um, and if you're not on your glass, you're not gonna see that. Yeah. And if the glass isn't extremely comfortable, extremely flat, yeah, you're not gonna uh, want to use it. Forgiving, right? yeah. then you're not gonna be on it. Yeah. And and so you know, in a in in the guiding area, I I can't tell you. I don't know what the number of hours was. But uh, <laughs> That's if, a lot. The, if the sun was up, I had binoculars stuck to my head <laughs> unless we were on a stock yeah. or pulling a trigger. Right. 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 Uh, and so that's we went after that because it's absolutely critical. They have to be comfortable. They have to give you the right contrast so that you find that critter. When we talk about the, the resolution, one thing that a lot of people don't recognize is, I might just grab this. Yep. If you don't have high resolution, this these areas where, where uh, it goes from white to black, if it's to us, this looks like there's a black patch, there's a white patch. Right. When you look through it in a, in a binocular yeah. or a rifle scope or a spotting scope, the color gets separated as you magnify things. So I don't, I don't know how much huh. um, people have heard about this, but it's yeah. a curved lens, right? And every wavelength is a, I don't want to geek out too much. <laughs> no, this is interesting stuff. Wavelengths yeah. of light, the wavelength, you know, it, it goes up in, in a, on a, a pattern like this, a wave pattern. Okay, right? yeah. Different colors have different wavelengths. Right, right. So when you have just light, like is coming off of this, hitting a surface, they're gonna hit in different phases of that Okay. curve. Yeah. Now you're magnifying it. So when you try to magnify that, that's you want it to be bigger, 12 power, 15 power. Yeah. You've separated that stuff. Yeah. And you need to get it back together. Gotcha. Okay. And that's where it get the difficulty in getting resolution can right, come right, from. Right, right, right. And okay. when you're that testing it, what you'll see is a purple haze or something in here. I think a lot of people have heard of that before. You go look and see if you get a crisp line, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah, there can be, sometimes there can be yellows or purples kind of on the edge of the black, right? Yeah. And is that what you're seeing, those light, the, the colors trying to come back together? What you're getting kind of, is it's yeah. merging and overlapping. Right. Okay. And so you've got them blurring. Yeah. What does that mean in the field? What that means in the field is that white throat patch on a deer. You've got a mule deer laying there, he's in some sagebrush, or the brown brownish antlers sticking up. Yeah. The colors with the other stuff around them merge the the uh, kind of the crisp edge of the throat patch no, is no longer crisp yeah. and then the white isn't as bright white so it looks like a bush it doesn't look like a throat patch and an antler sticking up gotcha. and you'd be amazed how much difference that makes and and we focused mostly on things like that and on ease of use with the yeah. sandy m line right right and every detail matters yeah so. it really shows I, i'm learning something new i i, I knew it's called uh, so you can impress your friends you know, chromatic aberration right <laughs> that's what it's called it when, yep. when you have that the yellow and the purples uh but now i know the actual reason behind that so something super interesting there um, so there was, uh, there was a couple questions. Uh, I don't know who is, uh, they, they want to know, uh, they want to cut right to the chase. They were like, well, no, how much they are and where, when can I get them? Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> so what we're going to have is, is I don't have the, the middle platform here. They're coming yep. a little bit later. So this is a 42 millimeter. So just think 842 and 1042. Um, these depending on price and, uh, or I'm sorry, on, uh, whether you get gray or you get Camo, right? Yep. Um, the the eights are going to be in that eleven fifty to, to twelve hundred okay. range. Yeah. The ten forty twos are in the twelve to twelve fifty. So it just depends whether okay. you get gray or, or camo. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. As you come up and and get to the fifteens, these are already available, by the way. So in the in the fifteen fifty sixes, those are available now, and and you're looking basically thirteen ninety nine to fourteen fifty, depending yep. on on finish. Yeah, that's something we didn't mention too. So fifteen power, we've never had a fifteen power binocular before. Right. Uh, a little more magnification for you. Uh, I actually um, did some long range shooting, not a, not a hunting situation, but used this in lieu of a spotter. It actually worked really well. Uh, having that 15 power, so. It, there's a lot of advantage, as you yeah. noticed. So um, with rifle scopes, and then we've got to get back to availability date. Yeah, 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 sorry. That. I took um, you on a that's whole okay. tangent right there. I got super so, excited about the you know, 15. With rifle scopes, we're taught to shoot with both eyes open. At least I was. Yeah. Um, and that gives you situational awareness and other things. I think we've all noticed if you sit in glass with a spotting scope for a long time, you see people, they pull their a headband over, they tip a hat. <laughs> Pirate sit, patch, maybe. Sit yeah. and put your hand up. <laughs> And the main reason is if your brain's getting feedback at 1x and 65x oh, over here, that's, good, that's yeah. where you start can start getting some of the eye strain. So yeah. to your point, um, big eyes like this mm -hmm. are getting popular, especially you know in areas where you're going to glass a long ways for a long time. Yeah, because you mount this on a tripod, you sit behind it, it's relaxing. You mm -hmm. can use both eyes. 
uh, and in low light, two channels letting twice light in, uh, it's helpful over, over a spotting scope. In your case, yeah. it's super fast to look around and find a target. Right? Absolutely. So for PRS and then, or right, or right. And then I can I can zero yeah. in with the high mag scope and, and get on target quick. So, so uh, super great. So let me circle yeah, yeah. back. Uh, 42 millimeters, they're going to be in early July. So just shipping towards the end of this month is, is when they're headed out. 15, uh, 56 is there available now. Uh, mm -hmm. They've been out for, for several months. Several months yeah. And then the 50 millimeters, which will be 10 power or 12 power, those those are going to be available in August, and you're looking at that 1300 to, to 1350 for the 12s, and 12 to yeah. 1250 to 1300 for the 10x. Excellent. So. And uh, you know, we, we talk about value. That's a lot of you know, it's a lot of money. 1300 bucks. You know, you're not just you know, shelling out 1300 bucks. But value wise, I will <laughs> I will tell you that these. Yeah. It compete against pieces of glass that are twice its price point, right? And again, I encourage you to go out and test that theory. Um, just don't trust my word for it. But the actual value of these is huge. I think it, these these things, uh, like like anything that we're that we're trying to do in our in our factory here yeah. with binos, whatever we're trying to make these play well above their class that they're in. They're, they're so the value thing is huge for us. You take the VX Freedom. It's a you know 199 type rifle scope. Put it up against something that costs four, six, eight hundred, a thousand dollars. Tell us what you think. The same is true here. Right, absolutely. Right? And so we're trying to get that value out there with the right features. So, yeah. So that everything that you want it to do and nothing that you don't. So you're not paying for yeah. something that's yeah. in there that you don't want. Yeah. In glass, you want it to cut through and give you the right image. Yep. With the right brightness and the right ease of use and flat flat field. You don't need to pay for the other stuff, so it's not in there. We don't we don't mess with it that way. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, on top of the cool features it has, also the testing that goes into it, right? The the waterproof, um, oh, for sure. all the extreme mm -hmm. climate testing, and they have a lifetime warranty, uh, you know, just like the scopes do, right? So yeah, we're well, going to stand behind this same, product. Yeah. So, so same battery test. It's a great point. I'm glad yeah. you mentioned it. Um, the the testing that's done here is born from a legacy of, of military rifle scopes, if we're going to be honest about yeah, it. Yeah, that's where it came from. Yeah, so absolutely. what a lot of people don't know this, but uh, we supply more more long range rifle scopes to the US military than, than all other brands combined. Yeah. Um, and we've got a, a long history with, with serving our war fighters. And uh, that testing, in order to make sure that everyone's safe, that the products are functioning the way that they should, yeah has been developed over the last 50 years, right? right, right? right, right. And it translates directly into our hunting uh, products and into our observation products for all yeah. the same testing. Yeah, yeah. again, we we don't always know what the customer is going to do with the product, so we go always go to the extreme. And that's what we test things at, because we know yeah. that from there, anything down, that product is going to be able to uh, function, last a lifetime, and that kind of stuff. So um, let's see. Da -da -da. Are we having some technical issues? Yeah, I just think the iPad died, although it was plugged in. Oh, okay. okay. Well, we're, we're still we're we're still rolling live here, so <laughs> his <laughs> iPad died and his eyes got super big, and he's like, "What's going we on?" We weren't sure if we were talking to ourselves. <laughs> yeah, I was like, "We're just having a conversation now." Um, this is a great question. Uh, something that I get asked a lot. Uh, Chaz uh, Harder on Instagram. There, can you explain setting the diopter? Um, uh, both That's scopes and binos. Actually, this is great. We have examples of binos here. Uh, but yeah, uh, well, so I'll let the professionals know here. My guess is that you're talking about binos, but we should probably touch on both. Yeah, we could. Um, yeah. So on a binocular, the majority will have the single eye focus, so the diopter adjustment, the one that you're talking about, will be on the right eye. That doesn't necessarily matter. What we'll talk about is the way that you want to set this, because there's two things that a lot of people do. Let's let's back it up real quick. So what is the diopter setting? Ah, it's great. It's actually great. focusing the binos or scope to your individual eyesight, right? Because mm -hmm. everyone has different eyesight. When you're a kid, you usually have really good eyesight. As we get older, I'm surprised you don't have reading glasses yet. <laughs> oh, I see where, I see where you there. went there. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> your eyes degenerate and yeah. um, your, your diopter is going to have to change, right? So yeah, just a little uh, uh, context there when we're talking about diopters. So. Right. So on rifle scopes, it'll, it'll affect the focus of your reticle, which yeah. in turn affects a lot of other things. Yeah. So let's start with, uh, with binos. And essentially, my left eye and my right eye will have different vision. So will yours. Um, it's, just, it's just a fact. Both eyes aren't exactly the same. Well, you've got two tubes here and one focus, right? So when you're running the single focus, you need to balance the the binocular for the difference between your two eyes. So what you typically would do, uh, for this example, we're gonna say that the diopter is on the, the right channel for me, it's on the right side. 
what you'll do is take and a lot of people close their eye. That's, that's not a good thing to do. I cover the objective or I close the lens cover. And what you're going to do is cover, look through the bino, both eyes open, mm -hmm. because as soon as you close this eye, it changes the prescription in this one right. and vice versa. Yeah. Both eyes open, look at something out that's distant quite a ways away where focus gets critical, um, where a little bump on the focus ring makes a bigger difference. Mm -hmm. So pick a tree in the distance, the top of it, focus in on it, get it crisp. Now take and cover the other side, look at the same object, and turn your single eye adjustment. What you've essentially done is, let's just, for illustration purposes, say that my, you know, this is if both eyes were exactly the same, but my vision's somewhat like this. Right. I'm, I've set the first one to make sure the bino's focused on that tree. Yep. Now I actually need the right one to be up here, so I tweak it. Yep. Okay, now it's in focus for my right eye. Compensated, yeah. Now when I, when I run the center wheel, they're doing like this. Yep. And so that's set for me, it's done, um, we're ready to go, and that's the best way to do it. Now your vision's gonna be different than yeah, mine. It yeah. doesn't change real fast, yeah. but keeping the eyes open makes a big difference. Yeah. A lot of people don't do that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think most people know that there's that focus setting on a scope. Obviously you're turning the eye shell or a mm -hmm. fast focus, you're turning that little, um, um, the eyepiece on the back of it, right? But uh, it's actually surprising the number of people didn't know, don't know that there's diopter settings, and they'll be using binoculars, you know, for you know years, and have never actually set the diopter to yep. their actual, you know, eyes. So it'll help a ton. It'll it, help eye fatigue. It's a game changer. Um, if, you a game changer. if you haven't done it, yep. um, do that. It, it makes a, a really big difference. You, you're, you spend a lot of money on good glass. Make sure you're getting the most out of it. A little bump on that diopter can go a long way. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, on, oh, yeah, go do ahead. we want to talk about rifle scopes? Yeah, I'm well, guessing yeah. that was a bino question. I think that's probably a bino okay. question, but um, just there are there's a diopter setting on your, your scope too. Um, yeah, well, actually, let's touch on so, it. Since so we'll, we'll go a little it. quicker. Um, yeah. If you want to hear more, let us know, and, and we'll get there. But most people just focus their the eyepiece, so it turns one way or another. Sometimes they lock, and then you turn it. Sometimes it's a faster focus. Yeah. The intent of that is if you've got a rifle scope, the uh, I wish I had something here. The the back half of it turns and it focuses you on the reticle. And there's front focal plane, which would if the front's up here, and there's rear. The back eyepiece focuses your eye through the back half of the scope on the reticle. Mm, yeah. If you've got a side focus or a, an adjustable objective, which are, are pretty old now, you right. don't see many of those. But when you turn the side focus, it's focusing kind of the front half of the scope okay. to lay on top of the reticle. It's a good way to think about it. And if you haven't adjusted the eyepiece back here, yeah. when you think that you've got everything laid on top, which yeah, is it's, it's in focus, yeah. then you look through the scope, move your head, and you, you go, what's well, in focus, but I have parallax. Um, and so really, the best thing to do is take and look at a blank background. Mm -hmm. Distance doesn't matter. So yeah. what you don't want to do is look at a target, because now your eye tries to focus on the target, not the crosshair, whatever the type of reticle you have. Just look on a, on a blank wall, um, glance through there, make a correction until it feels like it's well in focus for you. Yeah. Look away, let your eye relax, come back, fine tune it to make sure, yep, that's where I want it. Lock it down if it has a lock. Yeah. And now you can almost use your side focus uh, as a focus yeah. rather than a parallax. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, so so basically you're just focusing the reticle, making it nice and crisp. Cool little pro tip there to focus it, come off the scope, give your eye a second, come back, because what your eye's gonna do, it's gonna try to compensate for the focus mm -hmm. or, or non-focus, fuzziness of the reticle, right? Yep. And you just wanna make sure that it is completely sharp and crisp when you get back on the scope and look at it. So Yeah, main reason being you want you want the reticle crisp while your eyes relaxed. Yep. Great right. great question. Uh, Hawkins85 on Instagram, uh, what's the best way to clean my lenses since we're talking about lenses here? And is there any cleaners I should stay away from? Um, I, I, you know, again, I would go back to when we were going through tours and stuff down the factory. <laughs> I actually show people how the uh, the assemblers, how they're cleaning the lenses in final. And uh, they're just using um, soft bristled like craft brushes and acetone. Yep. Um, obviously, if you have a lot of gunk on there, you're going to want to not use the acetone right away. Um, you know, just to push the grit around. Yeah, right? just to push but the grit around, right? Yeah. One, one of the things that we say in, in is just anything that wants to fume away. Yeah, easily, right? So that's the nice part is you can clean with it acetone. Then it's volatile, which just means it gases off. Yeah, it um, evaporates. So you don't have to keep rubbing it till it dries, it'll evaporate on its own. Yep. So things like that work great. Um, 
I, it, yeah. It just depends I, on the situation. You know? I keep... Uh, I, I Don't we, come in a creek. We, yeah, right. Don't <laughs> come in a creek. Obviously, you know, they're waterproof. I keep lens pens on my battle belt when I'm at the range, right? Because uh, and you may, it'll make you a popular guy. Um, mm -hmm. your, your buddies have dirty optics. So you hand them a, 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 a lens pen and get all the grit off there. So... Uh, yeah, a couple the, different the, ways. Those to do lens it. pens are essentially look like a like a standard oh, pen yep. like this. Poke this end out; it's got a brush on it. Yep. What a lot of people don't know: you brush the dust off, then they turn around and there's a, a little plunger on the other end. The most common phone call we get on those is mine's dried out. It's it's actually a dry compound that's in there. <laughs> so it came; it was dry when yeah. you got it. Yeah. Um, so you're not going to see anything on there. You put it in the cap, twist it, and then it is essentially a little kind of a buffing type compound yep, that cleans it. Little circles. They're a great tool. They're not much bigger than that. Can and I have my pen back now? Thank maybe. You. I'll put them with my <laughs> reading glasses. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, dun, dun, dun. What's the uh, what's the main difference between the BX4 and BX5? I think that's a that that's a good question. Beyond Backcountry on IG had that question. So. Okay. Yeah. Um, Beyond the backcountry? Uh, beyond the backcountry. Oh, there he is. Oh, oh, All right, oh Zach. Is, is this someone? Okay. Oh, I know, I know, I know. Yeah. You were looking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the main, the, the two main things are going to be the some of the um, when we talk about the lens coatings, whether it had the Guardian coatings, so that hydrophobic um, coating that that keeps your lens. Uh, I'm sorry, your fingerprints, your dust, your water yeah. uh, off the lens. Yep. That's one of them. The other thing is optical design, honestly. Yep. So when you get into a, a roof prism binocular, which is what these are, that's the type that you look straight through. Poro prisms are the ones that, uh, this is how I tell my kids, like grandpa used to have, where you, <laughs> yeah. you hold it out here and your eyepieces are in here. Yeah. Um, the light goes through those in a different way. On a roof prism binocular, you get all your magnification from two prisms that are right here, and the light has to bounce around a lot of times. Mm. Um, in order to do that to keep getting magnification. So it goes in, it's bouncing around a bunch until it finally comes out magnified, right? Prisms act like lenses. Uh, in order to do that well on a roof prism binocular, it gets really difficult because you've got a lot of very small bounces happening in there. And so a lot of the, the difference that you're going to see between something like a Sani M and a Pro Guide is going to be the color fidelity uh, as you work your way up and that ease of use is related to the prisms. Yeah. Uh, it comes back to how, how we design the prism and more, more importantly, honestly, the, the specification. Yeah. You know, holding that tight of a tolerance um, has some serious advantages, yeah. but it comes with cost. So it's always the downfall about optics, I think, from a selling point, <laughs> is when you're trying to talk about the differences and stuff, it's stuff that you can't see. It's on the inside, right? I can't open it up and show you what it looks like. Yeah. Um, but that, yeah, that's a great explanation of the difference there, for sure. Um, interesting question here. I think this is a good one to touch on. Uh, Manuel Vasquez on Facebook. Do you perform full optical acceptance testing on 100% of your binos, uh, or do you only perform lot testing uh, 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 during full rate production runs. So um, he's just kind of like uh, the QA process, sure. right? Which I think is interesting. Um, obviously, again, we're being transparent. We do import these binoculars. Um, we get them in. But when they come back here, they actually come back to loophole. They come to the factory. Right. right. So, so we're actually looking at them and doing QA processes yeah, so on them. It right? might help to kind of just walk through what that process yeah, looks like. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the team here works on design, whether that's industrial design, optical layout, lens coating design. So as we talked about from the ground up, you want to work on um, what are the materials available to get the, the end result we have. Mm -hmm. We need to verify that that has been met. So we, yeah. we've done the design work. When it comes back in to, to answer these very specific question that you have, is, which is, do we test 100% of everything? Uh, the answer is yes, at first. Um, until we get statistical information that tells us that we can start inspecting smaller amounts of lots, we're absolutely going to check them all. Um, but, you know, I don't want to get into a ton of our policies no, and practices. Yeah, yeah, but, for sure. But what we're going to do is very high statistical significance to make sure yeah. that when they, when they ship out to, to you, yeah. that, that they're right. Yeah, um, and that they match everything that we designed them to, and yeah. all the specs. And, and I think I think um, the main point there, and the main thing I like to emphasize is we're not just drop shipping from a uh, from the manufacturer no. to a retail store, right? No. Without lot, us in the process, a lot more complex. Yeah, we we. <laughs> We're a little bit of control freaks. We like controlling stuff a lot, and but it pays dividends, right, in the product. And controlling the quality of the binos that are coming in 
um, other things like that, I think is key yeah. again to if if it's got the loophole name on it, it's got a there's a level of performance and quality that needs to be in the product. Right. We're, we're not going to let it out without checking. So yeah, we, we want to make sure it's uh, it's performing the way that we created it to. Yeah, for so. sure. Um, let's see. We'll we'll grab one more question here. Um, oh, that was a good one. Robinson Outdoors on IG there. Uh, thanks for tuning in. For the guys out on the East Coast doing less glassing and wanting a kind of a middle of the road binocular, what would you recommend? Uh, so middle of the road is a, is a little bit tough to quantify. Yeah, um, yeah. And so you know, I, I like to go to Pro Guide for for the the money. Yeah. The Pro Guides are really hard to, hard to beat. Again, the value. Yeah. Yeah, and so it depends what middle of the road looks like. Yeah. Um, if you're that's that's where I would land based on what I'm hearing from yeah. the question. Yeah, yeah. I also would honestly I would look at eight powers. So yeah. one of the reasons that I've used ten by forty twos in the past was uh, call and trace. So ten power was about the the lowest I could go, and the guys that I guided with felt the same way to see trace on a shot, especially when um, right, wrong, or indifferent. The muzzle blast went off. Suppressors weren't nearly as uh, popular then, and and wearing earmuffs around didn't work. So there was a jump when the gun went off, but through tens I could still call trace. To be perfectly honest, there's a lot of advantage to eights, to, to 842s. So if I were picking and it was east and I wasn't, I don't know if it's green fields or you know, you're looking down power lines, I, I, without knowing that, yeah. where I would land is an 8x42 Pro Guide yeah. um, because that's that's going to going to do more than yeah. uh, than what you need, I, I think. I think that's one of those things. It's uh, more magnification is not always the answer. Um, sometimes uh, I, I, yeah, I would prefer an eight power depending on the environment that I'm in for sure and how I'm going to be using it. So um, we got a lot of good questions today. Thank you guys for tuning in and, and interacting with us. So we got we got some hats to give away here. Okay. Um, let's see. I, I like the diopter question a lot. So Chaz Harder, on IG, uh, uh, DM us, uh, send us your info. You got a hat. Uh, I got one more hat here. Let's see what was another good one. You know what? That um, that testing question I think was really on point. Okay. Uh, so Manuel That's Vasquez great. on Facebook, uh, message us on Facebook. Get us your shipping information. We'll get a hat out to you. So Tim, I, I thank you for coming. Thanks for talking about the Twilight Max, the the BX5s. Sure. Um, uh, that was great information. I think I uh, hopefully everyone out there thought so too. Um, next time uh, we're going to be talking about uh, Punisher testing, actually the testing oh, that fantastic. our scopes go through. Uh, we're going to have Tim Kennedy on the show. It's going to be really cool. So make sure you guys tune in for that. And uh, until next time, we'll see you guys. Okay.